Video games have significantly evolved over the years. I guess that's kind of an understatement, but it has been a truly remarkable sight. In my lifetime alone, we've gone from the likes of Metal Gear, one of the most advanced games of its era, to Metal Gear Solid V, one piece of a giant puzzle that makes up a grand story that spans decades. And if you want to be a part of a giant puzzle that makes up a grand story that spans decades, make sure to subscribe to the channel for more content like this. It's your civic duty. Regardless of how in-depth games become, regardless of how beautiful the visuals get, we will all still remember the experiences we have had in the past, both the fond memories and the bad. This nostalgia is not exclusive to video games, but always I find it hits me the hardest with the medium. Perhaps it's the countless hours I have spent in these games' worlds, or the art form itself speaks to me more directly than others. Whatever the case, I personally get extreme nostalgia from video games. Like many of you, video games entered my life at a young age. In fact, I remember reading my baby book when I was in my teens, and these were books parents used to keep different stories and pictures in before smartphones and social media. One of the first things written in mine was from my mother, and it was the story of me playing Super Mario Bros. at three years old, and apparently beating it that next year. I don't really have any memories of this, but I can glide through the first Mario with ease, maybe with some warm-up these days, but it still shows today. The point I'm getting at is that many of us started to gravitate towards gaming at a very young age, which would explain why we have such warm and fuzzy feelings about the games we played during those times and when we grew up. These shape our tastes, and these experiences stayed locked in our minds seemingly forever. One such game for me is Full Throttle, a graphic adventure game by LucasArts and designed by the legendary Tim Schafer. I have odd memories when it comes to Full Throttle, and before we go over how great this game is, I want to share it with you, and I would love to read your thoughts about this story in the comments. When I was a young man, maybe 8 or 9, I lived in an apartment complex with my parents. My aunt and uncle lived there as well, and I was friends with the dozen or so kids my age who lived there. The point I'm trying to make is that there was a community, and most of us knew each other pretty well. Even though it was a pretty big complex, actually the biggest I've ever seen. Full Throttle comes into the mix when somehow I managed to meet this college age guy. And from what I remember, he always had a few people in his apartment, both male and female, but he would let me play games on his computer. I don't even remember how this arrangement happened. The games I remember playing the most are Day of the Tentacle, which deserves its own video, and Full Throttle. This would be quite odd by today's standards, and as a 32 year old man, I do question it a bit, but looking back, nothing weird or wrong ever happened, it was just a dude in his 20s who didn't mind me gaming on his rig. I still think it was strange, and I would love to know what you guys think about that, but again, keep in mind nothing nefarious was ever mentioned, let alone attempted. However, one time he told me that giant alligators were in the sewers, and everybody had to go home or they would get you. I imagine this was his way of getting me to leave, so I was probably just some annoying apartment kid to him, you know, in hindsight. This did cement Full Throttle in my mind as a big piece of nostalgia, so when the remake was released, I was excited to play through this masterpiece as an adult to truly understand how awesome it was. But enough about me, let's talk about why Full Throttle is God tier. <laughs> Initially, Full Throttle was released in 1995, though we would be treated to a beautiful remaster in 2017, which is going to be what I use footage from. This would be Tim Schafer's first crack at being project lead, head writer, and designer for a game, after working on similar projects for LucasArts. Though at first glance, one might think the game is set in a post-apocalyptic world space, Schaefer would clarify saying it's just set in a bleak vision of the near future, adding it was never meant to be post-war or anything like that. The game takes the classic point-and-click adventure formula and adds a biker murder conspiracy to make a great story. The talented cast does wonders to bring the adventure to life, boasting Roy Conrad, Mark Hamill, Hamilton Camp, Tress McNeil, and Kath Saucy, with a terrific soundtrack by the Gone Jackals. The game follows the story of Ben, the leader of the Polecats. We start by seeing Malcolm Corley on his way to a shareholders meeting at his factory. Corley Motors is the last domestic motorcycle manufacturer in the country. The vice president, Adrian Ripburger, rides with Malcolm, and we hear Corley has his suspicions of Ripburger. Ripburger, you're dumber than dirt! Oh, Mr. Corley, if you'd only listen to my plan, my vision. I know your plan, Ripburger. You're waiting for me to die so you can take over my company. 
<laughs> That's horrible. I am not waiting for you to die. You know I've never liked you, Rip. But you have business know-how and killer instincts that I respect. Why, thank you, sir. But this latest idea of yours, riding up to our shareholders' meeting with a gang of bikers? Who do you think you're fooling? The shareholders, sir. It's good PR to be seen hobnobbing with real Corley Motors customers. What do you know about our customers, Adrian? You've never even been on a bike. We are then introduced to the Polecats. Corley is impressed by the gang and sees them as someone he could ride with, so he orders the limo to step on it and find out who they are. We see the kickstand bar, and the Polecats are inside blowing off some steam. The gang seems worried about the lack of cash they possess, but Ben has a feeling something is coming their way. Something big. Corley makes a grand entrance and asks who drove over his car. After a while, Ripburger starts to wonder what is taking so long. <laughs> but Malcolm, isn't that illegal? Not back then it wasn't. <laughs> so who do you ride with these days? He rides with me. Although I'm sure he'd much rather be riding with your little club. I told you to wait out in the limo, Rip Burger. I thought you might like some help with your sales pitch, sir. Sales pitch? Yes. We've come here today to offer you and your men employment. Mr. Corley requires an escort to the annual Corley Motors shareholders meeting. Does this look like an escort service to you? You would be well compensated for your time, of course. Not interested. It's uh, fairly obvious that you could use the money. Listen, I said we're not for rent. The Polecats are not goons for hire. Not even if it were Malcolm Corley's dying wish? Rip Burger! That does it! I'm gonna... Hold on there, Malcolm. If you don't mind, I'd like to step outside with Mr. Rip Burger for a little chat. Excellent idea. During their chat outside, Rip Burger informs Ben that Corley only has a few months to live. Ben is a bit bothered by this news. Malcolm is a nice guy, but he's also the country's last motorcycle maker. Ben wonders what will happen to Corley Motors when he kicks the bucket. Rip Burger promises all will be revealed if the Polecats escort them to the shareholders meeting. The Polecats are not thugs for hire, and Ben is adamant about this. They won't be taking this gig. So Rip Burger gives Ben one final offer. Well, I'd like to make you just one final offer. <laughs> <sighs> Bolus, take this coat and go get his motorcycle. We'll have to tie up this little 200 pound loose end. <laughs> It'll need to look like an accident. That stuffed shirt actually thinks I'll leave him in control of Corley Motors when I go. Boy, is he in for a surprise. Hey, where's Ben going? Your colleague has decided to accept our generous offer after all. As a matter of fact, he's gone on ahead to scout out the route. He did? Well then, let's roll em, boys! Yahoo! Corville, here we come! We awake several hours later in a daze. Clicking around will have Ben hit the dumpster he is now inside until eventually punching his way out altogether. Back in front of the kickstand, we see Ben's bike. When we try to use it, Ben finds out some joker took his keys. He doesn't like that. Making our way into the bar, we can speak to the bartender. Eventually, Ben gets frustrated and uses his charm to get answers. You know what might look better on your nose? What? The bar. <coughs> now don't mess around with me. All right, all right. I got your keys, but I don't know nothing. They had guns. They told me to stall you as long as possible. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I overheard them say something about an ambush up the road. What else? Nothing, nothing. Look, man, here are your keys, all right? Oh, uh, someone did say something about killing you and making it look like an accident. They didn't do too good of a job there, but why ambush the pole gants? I'd better get moving. After securing the keys, Ben is on the road again. Ben gets antagonized by a member of the Rot Wheelers, a rival gang. After stomping him in a fight, 
we get hit with some technical difficulties. <laughs> This is gruesome. My editor better print these in color. Now I have to get you some help, I suppose. Oh. Ah, quit moaning. I know someone around here who can fix anything. Ben wakes up to find a masked figure staring at him. Turns out she's a mechanic named Maureen, and the person that found Ben is a reporter. Maureen wants to fix Ben's bike, but she lacks the parts. We need new forks, someone has run off with her welding torch, and of course, fuel. Turns out, she's a pretty gifted mechanic, and this is probably the best place we could wind up. So we have to help get these parts to fix the bike. Before leaving Marines, we see a photo of her and her uncle at their old Ming farm. Seems to mean a lot to her. On the way out, we get to chat with the reporter that saved Ben on the side of the road. Ben asks for a ride to get ahead of the ambush, but the reporter says she doesn't have any wheels, so we need to find the stuff for our bike. As we leave the screen, we see the reporter speed off in what is very clearly a car, so she was lying through her teeth. The search for parts is split up between three areas. First, we check out a trailer with some peculiar lighting coming from it. After persuading the guy who lives here to open the door, we are free to look around. And down the shaft, amongst some strange sculptures, we can find the welding torch that Mo is missing. There is a gas tower on the north side of town that is a perfect place to look for fuel. Once Ben gets there, we see that it's locked up tight. Nothing we can handle. Inside, we find out the tower is rigged with an alarm, but with some clever creative stealth, we can get what we came here for. Remain where are you? Hey, I don't see anybody. Maybe nobody's there. But who set off the alarm before we? Maybe someone is just fooling with us. Uh, you must have missed that last guy. Well, if you could hold this thing still while I'm shooting. I'm going down for a closer look. I don't see nobody. He must have run away. Yeah, we would have seen him running from the air. He must be hiding up in the tower. We got him treed. Let's go up and get him. We give the gas tank the big suck without the cops seeing a thing. So our bike has fuel again no matter how much of a bad taste it's left in Ben's mouth. Now, to the junkyard to secure some forks. Climbing inside, we see a junk haven. Unfortunately, this one is guarded by a fierce dog. Using some meat Ben found in the trailer, we can distract the mutt in the car long enough to rig him to a big magnet crane. After that, we just grab the forks and take our leave. The bike should be good to go now. Am I cool or what? You're amazing. I should crash that thing every day. So what's the surprise? Oh, just your average everyday pre-regulation destroyer class solid fuel recoil booster. You're serious? Yes. But only the vultures. I have my connections. Now, are you going to try this thing out or not? Ooh, I wish I had a camera. I wish I had some way of paying you back. Just beat it, will ya? You're scaring away my regular customers. Bye, Mo. Send me a postcard from the ambush. <laughs> 
Due to Bin's actions at the gas tower, the road out of town is flooded with police. We can solve this by hitting the alarm at the tower again, and when all the cops rush it, Bin can make his daring escape. Up the road, Bin meets up with the rest of the polecats. Ben, how'd you get behind us? Where are the suits? Corley's making a pit stop. He has a bladder the size of a thimble, man. Ripburger? Haven't seen him in a while. Ben, man, what's the deal? Did you find something up the road? Are we headed for trouble? No. We're in it. Put my head in a basket, cause I'd had a tank full. When she blow my gasket, I surely was thankful. Till I head for the skies up above It's a woman with wheels that I love Come on, old man. I got ya. Now, do something incriminate, like ambush somebody. Aha, the plot thickens. You shouldn't have laughed at me in those board meetings, Malcolm. What a psycho. Gotcha. Hey, look what I found in the bushes. What is that? It's a chokehold. Come here and I'll demonstrate. It's got a camera. I'll get her. No, Nestor will take care of her. You have an important engagement with the rest of the Corley family. Right. But don't forget to destroy that camera. Yeah, yeah. Now then, Malcolm, how about one for the road? Corley? Corley? Ben! <coughs> I guess Rip Berger couldn't wait for natural causes. Just like him to hit a man when his flies down. <coughs> Rip Berger did this to you? Yeah, he knew I was dying, and he knew that my will would put him out of a job. He wants to take over Corley Motors, Ben. Sell it off to foreigners, lay off workers, start making minivans. You understand me? Minivans! Oh. <coughs> you gotta hurt him for me, Ben. Promise me, you'll hurt him bad. I promise. <coughs> I want my daughter to take over the company. You have a daughter? Yeah. And she's a real mechanical genius, Ben. Rebuilt her first carburetor when she was four. Eh, I used to call her the diaper dynamo. <coughs> Find my daughter, Ben. Find Maureen. Maureen? Makes sense that Maureen is so handy with auto parts now. We see her working at her shop, and Bullis attempt to take her out. Ben heads back to her shop, and Maureen searches the suit to find his gun, a camera, and an ID linking him to Corley Motors. By the time Ripburger and Nestor catch up to Bullis, she is gone. After doing a sweep of Moe's shack, Ben heads back to the kickstand, where we find the reporter in the dumpster out back. She wants Ben to contact her editor because she has pictures of the Corley murder, but one of the thugs took the cameras. She tracked the guy to Melonweed, but she's too scared to go near there, so she gives Ben a fake ID to get through the roadblocks. Inside the kickstand, Ben gets some pretty shocking news. Hey, killer. What? Hey, it's cool. Her secret's safe with me. What secret? Haven't you been watching the news? Once again, our top story tonight, Malcolm Corley, owner of Corley Motors, was found dead at a rest stop just outside the town of Melonweed. Apparently, the benevolent patriarch and CEO was viciously beaten about the head and neck, savagely and without mercy. Police have arrested a notorious outlaw biker gang known as the Polecats. No. With the exception of their leader, who is still at large. Roadblocks have been set up along Highway 9 in an effort to apprehend this dangerous and violent criminal. We've been set up. With the use of the fake ID, Emmett the trucker can give Ben a ride to the old mink farm. Ben wakes up to find Emmett working on the truck. Loose hose, nothing big but he took the hose from Ben's bike to fix it. This sends us on a search for a replacement to get back on the road. Luckily for us, there is a hose inside the chest in Moe's old room, but as soon as we find it, she speeds off from the garage. While chasing her down, Ben sees that she took his booster fuel, and Emmett returns in his truck. The cavefish make an appearance as we have entered their territory, and this causes Emmett to dump his cargo, 
but the cave fish hit the big rig with an explosive device that manages to take out the only bridge over the gorge. The cave fish have no use for the cargo, so they take their leave. Nestor and Bullis show up at the mink farm to wait for Mo, but while they think they are early, Mo is long gone. Ben can grab a handful of fertilizer at the crash site that is sure to be useful later. With the help of the tire iron, we can knock over the load to set up a trap for later. Time to head back to the mink farm. Rip Burger's cronies are ready for the pursuit, and all Ben has to do is lead them right to the spot. It's Nestor's fault. Get in quick. I have a plan. We're going to lure the quarry running out of hiding with a bike. Boss, she already has a bike. Yes, but this one she worked on with her father. It's an emotional thing. Don't try to understand. Now hurry. Ben makes a U-turn to grab the hover bits off the town car. To get the booster we are after, Ben will have to hit the old mine road, a highway known for its biker gang fights. Along the way, Ben catches up with Father Torque former leader of the Polecats. He offers sage advice on the rival gangs. Father Tork, I need your help. The gang's in jail and the law. Ben, I'm not the leader of the Polecats anymore. You are. Can't you see I'm on permanent vacation? Ben will need to get a booster before he will be ready to jump the gorge. Luckily, one of the biker groups used these devices on their bikes and can be persuaded to let us borrow it. After a few fights on the old mine road, Ben will have what he needs to get some goggles from the cavefish. Using them while riding on the road will reveal their hideout, which rumor has it contains a ramp we can use to jump the gorge. Grabbing the ramp, Ben can take it back to the bridge, and it seems we have everything necessary to jump the gorge. So with a running start from Uncle Pete's mink ranch, Ben rolls the dice. Finally, we have made it to Corley Motors. Down at the gift shop, we can secure a toy bunny with some good distraction tactics. The bunny will surely come in handy later. The vulture's hideout is north of Corley Motors. And look at that, there is a minefield in front of it. Good thing we have a toy that'll just hop forward to test it out. Using the battery from the bunny, we can further distract the shopkeep by getting the RC car stuck behind the turnstile. So now we can take all the bunnies we need to traverse the minefield. That's the guy I was telling you about, Susie. You sure? Yeah. That's the guy who killed my father. All right, vultures, rack them up. Let's rip him quick. With a silver tongue, Ben can talk himself out of this sticky situation. Using the nickname Mo's father called her when she was young does the trick. Then, Mo takes a look at the photos from the murder, which proves Rip Burger did the deed. Rip Burger says he won't do the shareholders meeting until Mo and Ben are dead. So a scheme gets put in place. Okay, so here we go. Faking Ben and Maureen's death. Act one, scene one. Adrian Ripburger, in a desperate attempt to lure our Maureen out of hiding, has developed the following lame-ass scheme. First prize at tonight's smash-up derby is a vintage hardtail that Mo restored with her dad. Rip hopes Mo will try to nab said bike on account of her sentimental attachment to it. So Ben and Mo play along, put on disguises, and enter the demolition derby, which ends tragically when their cars explode and both are presumed dead. Uh, question. Please save your questions until the end. Now, the explosives in Mo's car can only be triggered by a head-on collision with Ben's car. This ejector seat projects Mo clear of the explosion, and she parachutes to safety. Don't you think someone will notice her ejecting out of her car? No, they'll all be watching you running around on fire. Yeah, that's another question I have. When your car explodes, you climb from it in flames and run around the stadium distracting the audience. In your cute little asbestos suit, of course. <laughs> That's some plan. All right, then. Let's go blow your little darlings up. At the derby, we see the participants. Rip Burger watches on, seeing through the disguises. We see the cronies have joined the destruction as well. 
Ben has to stall out the rest of the cars if he wants to keep the plan in motion. Once it's down to just our heroes and the Boom Boom Brothers, Ben gets the job done. We have to make this a situation, so Ben needs to set the stadium up to start a bigger diversion, which causes the derby to shut down and the audience to leave. All that's left is the Boom Boom Brothers. Ben finds a way to dispatch them as well. Afterward, Mo has her old bike torn apart. We need to find the key within the parts, which lies in a security code. Mo says there was a spot she used to kick as a child to get into her father's office, so we gotta hit the right place, and we are in. Putting in the code for the bike, we can get access to Corley's will. And in the next room, we see the production area for the shareholders meeting. The meeting has already started. Was not only an inspirational leader, but also a great personal friend. His loss affects us all deeply. Malcolm and I spoke often of the future. We talked of a day when Corley Motors would move beyond its humble beginnings into a new vehicular age. And although his tragic death took him from us sooner than anyone expected, Malcolm Corley's dream remains. And I shall carry out that dream in his memory. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to present to you the future of Corley Motors. The Corley Minivan. Ah, Corley was right. I never dreamed it would actually come to minivans, though. We can shut the whole thing down and fry the footage for the presentation. Now we are free to put our own cards and film in the reel, and play Malcolm's Will. This next slide shows our new, more aggressive corporate strategy. <laughs> Hello there! If you're hearing this, I must have croaked. Well, people gotta move on, you know, and make room for other people. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. I've made room for someone else to take my place at Corley Motors. And it ain't that embezzling crook, Adrian Ripburn. Rip, you don't belong at the head of my company. You belong in jail. Uh... I let that man talk me into far too many things. Like keeping my daughter a secret. He was wrong. I was wrong. I should have stood by her. I hope, Maureen, that you forgive me. And that you take over Corley Motors and run it however you see fit. All right, that's enough. How do I turn this damn thing off? I... Uh, I'm sorry you had to hear that tape from... One of Malcolm's psychiatric sessions. And near the end, he, he suffered many paranoid delusions. He was haunted by powerful forces of his own creation. And here's one of them. <gasps> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Maureen Corley, and do I have a heck of a story for you. By the time I'm done, you'll see why this man should be in jail. Hey! With Mo calling the shots at the meeting, Ben can follow Ritberger out, and he will be easy to track. Meeting up with his truck on the road is no small task, but backup is right behind us. Ben has to get control of this vehicle, which means Ritberger needs to get out. We can use his cane to stop his engine fan and a tire iron to stop the fuel intake, slowing it down enough to get swallowed by the plane. But the plane is heading for the gorge, and it needs to be stopped. Ben hits the brakes just in time, sending Ripburger and his truck to the edge of the cliff. With Ripburger's fate sealed, the gang only has to jump off the plane. Life is a game to him. And he played it by his own rules. He was a mystery to most of us. And yet, an inspiration to us all. He gave us freedom. He gave us power. He gave us wings. He gave us wheels. Thank you, Malcolm Corley. Giving us a dream that will never die.
So. So. Uh, maybe we could do lunch sometime next week. Yeah, sure. Lunch sounds great. Things aren't gonna change, are they, Ben? I mean, just because I'm in charge of the company now, and living in a mansion, and riding around in limos, that doesn't mean we won't spend a lot of time together, does it? Look, Mo, you're in a different league now. You shouldn't be hanging out with the likes of me anymore. But Ben... Oh, just a second. Hello? What? No, 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 that's crazy. Is he nuts? Look, move the meeting up to five and tell the plant foreman that I'm coming over personally to inspect those parts. I know, I know, that's what I told him. The game ends with Mo taking control of Corley Motors and Ben riding off into the sunset. A realistic ending to a fantastic story. One of the best I have experienced when I first played it in the 90s and one that still holds up today. Full Throttle sets is a tremendous staple of Tim Schafer's career and though sequels were discussed and even put into development, we would not see any of them come to fruition. Roy Conrad, the voice actor for Ben, would pass away in 2002, making it unlikely that we will see another entry in the series. Full Throttle was criticized for being a short title when it was released. Still, these days it fits right in for a fun point-and-click adventure with a great story, incredible visuals, and characters that still hold up today. That is why Full Throttle is God tier. I want to thank you for watching my video on Full Throttle, and if you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more content like this. It helps out the channel a lot. I want to thank my patrons and YouTube channel members, and a special thanks to my biggest supporters. Fireflare, JP Rivera, Primark Mustard, Edgy, Bill Scott Sheets, Alexander Cobb, Thomas, Papa Swanson, Billy Joe Jim Bob, and Mr. Z. Thanks again for watching. I'll catch you on the next one. It has been Mantis. Uh, I gotta testify. Come up in the spot looking extra fly. For the day you die, you gon' trust the sky. You gon' trust the sky, baby girl. Looking extra fly for the day you die.